Welcome to another episode of Watchdog on Mint Press. We are joined this week by some amazing guests. As you know, each week we are going against the grain with searing investigative journalism, which is often neglected by the mainstream media. So we hope that you can support us, whether through Patreon, if you can, or by sharing or liking or commenting on this video. Now, this week I am joined by filmmaker and journalist Pablo Navarretti, and I'm also joined for a second time by a very popular guest last time we had him on, the investigative journalist John McAvoy. Thank you very much for joining us today, gentlemen. And we are talking about John and Pablo's recent story on Mint Press around the Guardian newspaper and Julian Assange. So to start with John, it's been established that UC Global, the private security company that were securing, tasked with securing the Ecuadorian embassy, were actually through Sheldon Adelson working for US intelligence during this time and spying on Julian Assange. Some of their assignments entailed things like stealing uh, the nappies of Julian and Stella Morris's uh, child to uh, determine the paternal relationship of Julian to the child. Some of their tasks in the surveillance um, extended to the recording of conversations uh, or at least the recording of the inside of the toilets um, and also the spying on private conversations between Julian Assange and his legal team. So just as a first question, what was the extent of UC Global spying on Assange and even as you revealed Ecuadorian intelligence? Um, and how did that agreement between UC Global and the US government come about? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a good question because the, the extent of UC Global spying on Assange, now bear in mind, as you said, that they were originally uh, employed by Senain, uh, Ecuador's intelligence agency, to actually protect the Ecuadorian embassy in London, um, and you know, and therefore protect Assange to make sure um, that that nothing untoward was going outside outside the embassy. We know that British uh, intelligence intelligence officials and a number of other intelligence officials uh, were closely monitoring the Ecuadorian embassy, and it wasn't. Uh, I mean, Assange's safety was not in 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 any case um, secure at all. So how did the relationship between uh, UC Global and Sheldon Adelson actually begin? Well, David Morales, who was the CEO of UC Global, he went to a security and, and arms fair in Las Vegas in 2016. Um, and bear in mind that David Morales at this time is basically just a, a private mercenary. He, he'll sell uh, his services, his uh, security services to the highest bidder. So at, at this uh, security, uh, this arms fair at uh, Las Vegas Sands, um, uh, David Morales meets Sheldon Adelson, who, who you know owns the hotel. He's a Trump mega donor. He's also very good friends with at this time uh, the C CIA director Mike Pompeo. So they develop a relationship, and obviously David Morales' uh, contract at the Ecuadorian embassy in London is extremely important. Uh, it's an extremely valuable contact uh, to have for the U.S. security services, especially bearing in mind that in 2017. Uh, uh, WikiLeaks starts uh, revealing uh, the Cablegate, um, and Cablegate was the biggest, uh, the biggest CIA leak in CIA, CIA history. Uh, it was extremely embarrassing uh, for the agency, and I mean that's the, the level of embarrassment to the agency is revealed in the recent Yahoo News article that showed that the CIA actually plans to kidnap or assassinate uh, Assange on British soil, um, and shortly after the, the, those leaks were revealed. So, yeah, so you get this, this relationship developing between uh, Sheldon Adelson uh, and David Morales, the CEO of UC Global. Um, and as you say, UC Global uh, ramp up their spying operation on Assange massively. I mean, prior, prior to this relationship, there were only CCTV uh, cameras in the, in the Ecuadorian embassy. So they weren't actually recording uh, video. They weren't, record, sorry, they weren't recording uh, audio. Um, and I mean, uh, it, get, it gets to the point in 2017, as you say, when Romy Vallejo, who's the head of Ecuador, Ecuador's uh, intelligence services. Now, UC Global, that's been employed directly by uh, Romy Vallejo, 
is listening through the door, they're listening through the walls, uh, they're taking video uh, evidence, they're taking audio evidence of Julian Assange's private uh, conversations and meetings with the head of uh, Ecuadorian, uh, Ecuadorian intelligence. And then they're passing this on, and this has came out uh, in, the, in the ongoing trial that's, uh, that's taking place in, in Spain, in Madrid at the moment. So they're sending this video and audio footage directly to uh, what we, we have to presume was uh, David Morales' handlers in the US uh, intelligence agencies, um, basically to gather as much information um, on Assange as possible to prevent him from leaving the Ecuadorian embassy um, by, way of, uh, uh, by way of diplomatic unity. Uh, immunity, sorry. Um, yeah, so I mean, as uh, as you said, the the level of spying uh, was was absolutely was absolutely insane. I mean, uh, I'm told that in the Spanish case, uh, UC Global were taking pictures of the, of the door frames, of the doorknobs, of the window latches, of all of the windows, which clearly suggests that UC Global are collaborating in an attempt to uh, allow the CIA to kidnap Assange, basically. Uh, you know, providing the, the the necessary details for a kidnap attempt. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, long story short, you've got a, uh, a private security firm that's, that's, that's been contracted to protect Assange, gets turned by US intelligence agencies, um, and then embarks on this absolutely uh, perverse spying operation against Assange, uh, which includes monitoring, you know, his day-to-day -day activities, um, uh, including in, in the women's toilets where, where he, he had to conduct private conversations. Um, and, and, you know, this, this, will, this will hopefully all come out um, in, in great detail in the Spanish, uh, in the Spanish court uh, process that's going on at the moment. So that's a hell of a piece of information for any journalist, right? Surely you would assume that a journalist that got hold of this piece of information, that the private company who were employed to secure the embassy were in fact spying for US intelligence. Well, it seems that Stephanie Kirchgesner, the Guardian reporter, um, seemed to have knowledge of this in her communications with a UC Global employee. These communications are revealed in your article. And so the question would have to be asked, if Stephanie Kirchgesner of The Guardian did know this to be the case, why did she not make it public or even problematize it in communications? Exactly, and that's why it's so important that, that Stephanie and others who have worked on the two pieces that we highlighted in the Mint Press, which is only two pieces out of a, you know, a, a lot of coverage that The Guardian uh, has done with Julian Assange, and, but we concentrate on these two sort of explosive pieces that made news worldwide. And and, we're, and what we're saying is that until these questions are sort of credibly answered, uh, you can only conclude that there's been very serious journalistic malpractice. It doesn't make sense for her to have known this uh, almost a year before it became uh, publicly uh, first exposed in El País. Uh, and for her to have sat on this uh, information. It's very strange. Uh, and she really, I think it, it, she needs to, for her own journalistic reputation, uh, reply to some of these questions that are laid out very kind of succinctly um, at the end uh, of the article. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from, from, from these communications that we've obtained, we know that Stephanie Kirschgeis knew two things prior to them ever becoming public knowledge. Uh, the first of those things was, was that Assange's private communications were not only being recorded, but they were being transcribed by the private security uh, service that had been, you know, employed to protect Assange. And um, the second thing that we know is that Kirsch Gaysen knew that there was a relationship between Sheldon Adelson, uh, this Trump mega donor, and the Ecuadorian uh, embassy spying operation and, uh, and UC Global. So, um, I mean, what, what this tells us is that she, she, she was privy to quite, quite important knowledge much before, much before many, I assume, other journalists were, and um, especially the public. Um, and it, I, mean, I think it speaks to the level of solidarity that, that journalists had at this time with Assange. I mean, she was aware that his private conversations were being transcribed. And instead of publishing that as the story, instead of publishing the story that, you know, Assange's security detail are actually spying on him. 
she decided to sit on that knowledge and pursue Assange as a supposed subject of Russian malfeasance. And um, so I think it, it kind of tells you what, uh, what, quest what questions journalists were asking at this time, and they weren't asking the right questions. And, and sorry, just to interrupt there, and I think it also speaks to that kind of wider relationship, which we don't go into really. Uh, we provide some context, but about The Guardian and Julian Assange, a newspaper, you know, that got, you know, that WikiLeaks partnered with uh, alongside a range of other sort of mainstream newspapers initially, but then that relationship soured. Uh, and to the extent that, you know, the, the, the a password was uh, uh, apparently released in a book co-authored by one of the authors of the pieces that we looked at, Luke Harding uh, and uh, the investigations editor um, by The Guardian, uh, recklessly putting, a, you know, putting a, a number of uh, US, uh, US um, government uh, information out, out to the public uh, recklessly, and this is something WikiLeaks uh, accused the Guardian of, and they didn't really uh, have a, a credible defense. So this is a, a kind of relationship between a media organization and a journalist, which uh, was used to win the Guardian Awards when it, when it was uh, good for them, but they seem to have dropped him, and not only dropped him, but almost been at the vanguard or at the spearheading a campaign of vilification by the mainstream media, which I think to, to a large extent explains why the British public feel so little sympathy for him today, why, um, why essentially we have a publisher uh, sitting in a, in a British high security prison uh, facing the threat of 170, of being extradited to face 175 years in jail in a, in a US supermax. And I think the Guardian's relationship with Julian Assange is kind of speaks to that, um, lack of solidarity, um, but also I think it's something that goes beyond that. Um. I think also an interesting part of this is the knowledge that Sheldon Adelson, when you look at where he puts his money, he's solidly of the right in the US, one of the biggest funders in history of illegal Israeli settlements in Palestine. It would discredit the idea that Assange, and this was a carefully constructed mythology, was somehow of the right. Um, and this is where Paul Manafort comes into it. If we were to be clear that Sheldon Adelson, a Trump mega donor, was involved in this surveillance of Assange, then how would that cast, what kind of light would that cast on this claim around Paul Manafort? What was the claim around him? And what was the veracity of that claim? Yes, yeah, so in so November, the 27th of November 2018, The Guardian published what looked like one of the biggest bombshell reports uh, of the decade, maybe, which uh, stated as fact that in, in 2013, 2015 and 2016, Paul Manafort, who in the, uh, in the summer of 2016 became Donald Trump's key campaign manager, claimed that Julian Assange had been hosting private uh, meetings with Paul Manafort on three separate occasions, one of which supposedly coincided with the time that he became the, the campaign manager for Donald Trump. Um, and obviously this, this tied in with the, the prevailing narrative at the time, uh, the prevailing liberal narrative at the time of Russiagate, which uh, <clears throat> basically claimed that, you know, WikiLeaks had collaborated with the Trump campaign uh, and Russia to basically swing the election uh, in the favor of the, in favor of Donald Trump, um, an incredibly you know a, a very liberal narrative that uh, showed a total lack of self awareness uh, on, on on the shortcomings of, of Hillary Clinton and on the Democrats in general. Um, yeah, so I mean, so you've got this you've got this narrative uh, that's been that's been fed through all of the media this, at this time. And I feel like that's really reflected in both of these stories. I mean, both of them are trying to make this connection between the Trump campaign, uh, Julian Assange, and Russia. I mean, even despite the fact that Assange uh, and WikiLeaks had published uh, a trove of documents about Russia, um, he'd, he'd, he'd publicly said that, I mean, I think uh, Trump or Clinton is, is like deciding between chlamydia or gonorrhea. I mean, it was, it was quite clear that he's, uh, based on his leaking record, based on his political views, that he, you know, he had no sympathy uh, for the Trump campaign. Um, he certainly had no, no sympathy for the Clinton campaign neither. I mean, Clinton had overtly said, uh, why don't we just drone bomb this guy? Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the narrative that this spun was basically that the, the Assange was being used 
as as a tool of Russian uh, disinformation or or Russian malign influence uh, in in U.S. politics and in Western politics. Uh, but it's quite interesting to see what happened in the immediate aftermath of this article being published. Uh, I mean, the authors Luke Harding, Stephanie Kush Geisner again, and Dan Collins all walked back on this article. Um, it got immediately edited to say sources say that Paul Manafort visited Assange uh, in the embassy. Uh, so they changed it from a statement of fact to a statement of opinion from a source that they didn't bother to name. Um, they also, you know, qualified uh, large parts of the article to yeah to move it from statements of fact to statements of uh, coming from a third party from from their unnamed source. Um, and I mean, since then, Luke Harding has published a book called Shadow State. I mean, the entire subject matter of the book is about a supposed Russian malign influence uh, in Western democracies, which I'm sure there is a certain degree of, but um, certainly incredibly um, inflated by Luke Harding. And in this book, he makes no mention, zero mention whatsoever of this apparent meeting uh, between Manafort and Assange in the embassy in 20, 2016, which is quite an incredible uh a statement really from Harding that he has absolutely no faith in one of the biggest scoops that he's, that he's revealed in the last, well, in, in his entire career. Um, and it also speaks to the total lack of lack of accountability. I mean, we're talking about uh, Russian disinformation, for example, uh, alleged Russian disinformation in the, in the 2016 election, election campaign. But here you've got The Guardian, whose chief reporter has walked back on a, on a massive claim um, and they've provided no corrections. Um, they've provided no notes, uh, uh, not least any apology to Assange or any of the people that they um, that, that that they lied about. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it speaks a lot to the to the integrity of the, the Western media at the moment. That's, that such an incredible fabrication can remain on 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 the website's page. Uh, uh, yeah, without 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 any apology, any retraction. Yeah. Well- also, what's interesting is they watered down the Manafort story, but it's still up. Um, there was the other story about supposedly um, Assange escaping to Russia that was actually climbed down on uh, by the Guardian. What was that climb down like? And um, were there any consequences of this? I mean, maybe John can talk more specifically, but I, the, the end process of that climb down was a, a report by this the kind of internal reviewer that the Guardian, that the Guardian has, the Scott um, Trust, um, uh, headed by um, a gentleman that I think has a mentor and production company who, whose company produces, interestingly, Newsnight, a number of BBC programmes, uh, a number of, of documentaries. In fact, he produced a documentary on, on David Dimbleby going to Russia to investigate Putin's Russia. But he was the chair of that board, which essentially concluded that that, that, that article had been misleading and broke uh, the sort of, you know, the, the kind of internal rules that The Guardian had. Yeah, I mean, this, this was one of the, the, the first stories that, that, that attempted to associate um, Assange with, with a kind of Russian, with, 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 with the Russian state, basically, that, that appeared in The Guardian. Um, what it claimed was that when Assange was trying to leave the Ecuadorian embassy in London in late 2017, uh, his health was declining. And they ba- basically his legal team tried to find him um, a way to get to a third country by offering him a diplomatic immunity. Um, if he was posted as a diplomat in a third country, then he could basically be, be moved to that third country without um, being arrested by the UK officials once he left the embassy. Um, and yeah, so we, we we did an exclusive interview with one of with, with one of his lawyers, who was actually the main person involved in this process at the time, uh, Aitor Martinez, and he explained to us for the for the first time um, that the, the what actually occurred, because it's quite important to, to establish the facts of what actually happened uh, at this time, uh, which the Guardian clearly didn't didn't bother to do and still isn't bothering to do. Um, so yeah, Aitor was, was directly involved with 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 arranging this this diplomatic immunity. Uh, he initially presented Assange with a with a list of I think six countries: uh, China, Serbia, Greece, Bolivia, Cuba, and Venezuela. Uh, all of which uh, were, were happy to grant uh, uh, Assange diplomatic immunity. Um, however, the Ecuadorian foreign minister at the time, um, her cousin worked in the Ecuadorian consul in Moscow. Um, and so she came back about three weeks after they, they presented the initial plans. And she said, uh, look, 
um, I can arrange Assange to be posted to Russia uh, immediately. Uh, she printed out the diplomatic passport and everything. She said, this plan's ready to go. Um, his entire legal team, including Assange himself, all rejected this plan. They said, no, this is, this is crazy. You've tried, you know, you, you've created a plan um, to, to provide diplomatic community in the one country where there's, you know, a wild media narrative at, the, uh, at that present time being spun about Assange's links to Russia. Um, if they post him, if they, they said, if, 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 you post, if you post Assange to Russia now, you know, it's going to fan the flames of these, of these conspiracies and it's going, to do, it's going to do no good whatsoever. So they rejected this plan. Um, uh, it was at this point that Rami Vallejo visited on the 21st of December 2017 uh, to discuss with Assange plans to get out of the embassy. Um, one, of the, one of the last minute plans was to actually post him um, to the UK, uh, which, they, which they knew would, would not work. However, they thought it might buy them enough time to get out of the country in a diplomatic vehicle without getting arrested. Yeah, so you've got this. this so at this very very time, you've got UC Global spying, as we mentioned, on the discussions between Assange and Rami Vallejo. These end up with the US government, um, and then the next day, you have the US ambassador in Quito going straight to the Ecuadorian foreign minister and saying there is absolutely no way that we're going to allow Assange to flee the embassy or to 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 leave the embassy. And um, so the US basically, you know what effectively amounted uh, to a threat to the Ecuadorian government saying, we will not allow this uh, to happen. So the Ecuadorian foreign minister basically gets cold feet, says we need to cancel the entire operation. Um, and by Christmas 2017, the entire operation had been ground to a halt. Um, so when this, so this, this, is, this is according to people who were directly involved in, in, in the plans to get Assange to a third country. This is, this is what they say. They say they were testifying in court that this is exactly what happened. When pushed through the Guardian's disinformation machine, this came out as Assange plotted, uh, along with various uh, uh, members of the Ecuadorian embassy in London, plotted to flee uh, illicitly from the embassy with the help of Russian officials. Uh, in this article, they claim that Fidel Narvaez, who was the Ecuadorian consul uh, in, in, in the embassy in London at the time, they claim that he held secret meetings with Russian officials. Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of different spurious claims that Fidel uh, categorically denies. There's no evidence to support these claims. They come from an unknown uh, official. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this, this, so, so this story, um, Fidel complains about this story. He says, you know, you've made claims about me that, that are fictitious, not only fictitious, but dangerous as an Ecuadorian uh, political figure. You know, how am I supposed to get, to get a job in the future if, the, if these claims are left unattended on your website? Um, eventually, the Guardian took a few steps back. Um, they said, you know, there wasn't, uh, we, we were wrong to call it a plot. Uh, we were wrong to suggest that this was an illicit plan uh, to, uh, to get out of the embassy. Um, whereas, in fact, it was a legal plan, uh, which, which involved diplomatic immunity. Um, and yeah, so I mean, so yeah, you, you've, got, you've got a trend of The Guardian producing, you know, disinformation, which is coming from unnamed sources, uh, and all of it leads in one direction, which is to associate Assange with Russia. Um, yeah, in order, in order to basically damage his character so that people's, you know, solidarity uh, with, uh, with him and also people's you know, willingness to protect a free press is destroyed. And also on the Manafort story, it seems there was a secret author. Who was that? There, there's a Fernando Vicencio, who is, a, by all accounts, well, he's a National uh, Assembly, Ecuadorian National Assembly member today. But by all accounts, he's, uh, and he's, uh, he's, he describes himself as an investigative journalist. Um, but, but in Ecuador, he's known for being a very strident anti-Correa uh, activist. Uh, Rafael Correa, the, the, the left-wing former leader of Ecuador, who initially granted uh, political asylum uh, to Julian Assange. So he's, he's been, you know, a very strident anti-Correa activist. Um, his reporting has come under severe questioning, um, both in Ecuador, in in. In, in the UK, and, and it's curious that he's omitted from, from, from the article, uh, in one of the versions of the article. So today he's a political, um, he's a politician, uh, continues, if you go to his Twitter page today, he's, uh, he seems obsessed with Korea, his, his pinned uh, post from today is a, a critique of Korea. Um, and so he's a quite, uh, 
an influential figure in, in, in Ecuador, um, ostensibly an investigative journalist uh, and now a politician. Why is it interesting that The Guardian never produced any form of video or photo evidence for Paul Manafort's visit to Julian Assange? Yeah, I think that this is the key question, really. And this is a question that The Guardian's uh, three authors who, who, who worked on this story have never been able to provide an answer to. Um, we know from Fidel Nalvez that nobody could enter the embassy uh, without logging in, without being, uh, without being caught on the CCTV, uh, without providing their names, without uh, providing some form of identification, without having a uh, an official request to the ambassador in advance to let them know that they were arriving. Um, so you've got, you've got this claim that Paul Manafort, one of you know, uh, the, the, the most recognisable politicians in US politics at the time, arriving in London, one of the most uh, surveyed cities in the world, if not the most surveyed cities in the world, and going to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, which at the time uh, was one of the most surveyed places in central London itself. And supposedly he's managed to do this in, uh, and I mean, they even say, they even say in the article that he doesn't arrive in disguise, he's wearing a, a pair of brown chinos and a, and, a, and a cardigan or something. I forget, I forget exactly how to describe it. So he supposedly arrives in this incredibly surveyed area. Um, he manages to sneak into an embassy um, that, that, you know, records everybody who enters uh, uh, digitally and, and re registers their name and, name and uh, uh, personal information and somehow manages to do this on three separate occasions, one of which was during the 2016 election campaign. And, uh, and they didn't think maybe if this occurred, there should be some form of CCTV evidence for it or video evidence. Um, and this becomes even more sinister when you consider that Stephanie Kushka-Eisner, uh, over the preceding months before this story was published, was uh, communicating with a source at UC Global, the, you know, the security firm based at the Ecuadorian embassy, and uh, she was consistently asking for different forms of video footage, uh, different forms of diff uh, video footage of different things happening, such as Assange uh, standing out on the balcony. Um, and she's also asking for uh, records of the visitor's log uh, so that she can try and prove whether Nigel Farage visited the embassy just once or twice or however many more times. And um, so basically you've got, you've got one, of, uh, one of the Guardian's... Um, uh, key columnists is very much aware that they can access video uh, footage or, or camera footage from within the embassy. Did they even bother to ask for this story? I mean, were they so keen to, to you know, to jump at this story presenting a, Assange as a, as a Russian, uh, uh, a Rus uh, a, a use, uh, uh, you know, a Russian agent um, that they basically bypass the key evidence that, 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 that any, any journalist should have required to prove uh, the, to prove what they were claiming. Also, in this attempt to sort of paint Assange as of the right, there has been the story that Nigel Farage supposedly visited him. Also, is that true? Yeah, I mean it's it's true that he he visited Assange um, once. I forget I forget the date. Um, I forget the date now. But it's, I mean it's true that he he visited once. I mean this was covered there. Uh, across the corporate media. I mean, uh, this was actually covered uh, with the help of pictures. Um, here, Assange was pictured outside of the embassy, unlike Paul Manafort. Um, as soon as Assange, sorry, as soon as Farage entered the embassy, um, he was instantly recognizable, which is what you would assume would have happened with Manafort. However, there were claims that uh, Farage visited Assange at the embassy a second time, um, which seems patently untrue. Uh, he doesn't appear a second time in the visitor's log. Um, and, the, and the second time where he supposedly visits um, is, is at the time when Assange basically had, the, the Ecuadorian government had stopped allowing him visitors, had stopped, uh, had removed certain rights from Assange. So it seems, uh, it seems quite clearly untrue that Farage visited uh, Assange a second time on the day that he supposedly did. Now, what's interesting is uh, you can trace where this claim comes, come, uh, comes from. And the original claim that Farage visited a second time comes from the same Fernando Villavicencio, who is the unnamed uh, author on the story. So you've got someone who's, who's consistently, uh, who's, who has a record at least uh, of producing what seems like disinformation with regards to Assange. Um, and, and Stephanie Kushka-Eisner, 
is seems to be in contact with him because she's asking, oh, I heard, uh, you know, Nigel Farage has visited numerous times. Um, one other point that's important to mention about Fernando Villavicencio, the, the unnamed third author, is that he has been accused, credibly accused by the Ecuadorian government in the past of falsifying documents. Um, yeah, I mean, according to, yeah, I mean, at the time, I believe it was in 2014, uh, it was regarding uh, Chinese uh, investment in a national park in Ecuador. Um, apparently, they, they produced documents with metadata to suggest that the, the documents that he produced had been uh, altered after the fact. Uh, so, you've, you know, you've got someone who's, who, who, who it seems is, is, is quite definitely producing disinformation, not only about the Ecuadorian government, but also about Assange, that The Guardian is relying on for information about Assange uh, uh, crafting stories with him and then, and then you know, conceding uh, his identity as one of the authors. So that's incredibly suspect to me. And, and, and you've had, you know, authors such as Luke Harding who have had um, articles retracted by The Guardian because of essentially a sort of a level of plagiarism. So you've got all these figures with, with you know, with sort of journalistic um, issues in, in their past uh, being able to put out a number of stories which have lo a lot of internal inconsistencies, which you know, with some cursory looking into, uh, we put forward in that article. And it and it and as I said, it's it's incumbent on the Guardian to provide the credible explanation because otherwise, it, it I mean, the at, at best, it just seems as journalistic malpractice. There's a wider context that we didn't again look go into in this article, but it's about how the Guardian in the last few years has, has got closer to the British security services, um, how the, you know, they've run sort of exclusives with the head of MI5 and MI6 in the wake of Catherine Viner coming, how their um, deputy editors have joined the D-Notice Committee. So this is a wider context, which adds an extra uh, layer of sort of trouble, of, of, of uh, making these articles seem even more troubling. So, but in and of themselves, they are in, they 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 need they need to sort of respond to these questions, these very, as I say, succinct and and kind of straightforward questions that we've put at the end of the article. And just to take it again, uh, to take a step out again, I mean, what the Guardian's the relationship overall that the Guardian seemed to have had with Assange in its reporting, I think, could be fairly described as hostile. I think these two articles are kind of emblematic of that hostility. But, and if you look at some of the major issues of the last few years uh, in terms of um, figures who have really been uh, considered threats by the US government or the Western establishment, Julian Assange, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the cases I know perhaps uh, better in Latin America, Hugo Chavez, The Guardian has been at the forefront of campaigns uh, of vilification towards these figures. And this is, this is from a, a newspaper which is supposed to be a paragon of liberal left journalism that people look to for a progressive uh, interpretation of world events. And I think it's, it's highly troubling. Uh, all of this information taken as a whole is you know, highly troubling from the point of journalism and, and perhaps from, from other uh, spheres as well. As a sort of parameter line of the acceptable left within this country, how does the Guardian function to limit the prospects for real participatory change in this country? I think The Guardian uh, has in the past, you know, had excellent uh, security state journalism, um, but that has changed. And that's the reason why new uh, online uh, media outlets such as Declassified, um, which in the last few years has essentially taken over uh, to become the only real outlet in the UK media that is doing the kind of UK security state reporting that The Guardian once did. Um, as I said, with this kind of evolution in The Guardian's relationship to the UK security state, um, I think The Guardian has uh, left that kind of um, side of its journalism, which gave it a level of credibility when it came to saying that it was uh, holding power to account that it was, you know, a, a fearless advocate of truth-seeking journalism. In the past, it had columnists, it had a plurality, uh, some level of plurality of opinion with regards to, say, the Latin American left. I think that's changed. And I think that, I would argue that with the what we saw with Jeremy Corbyn, I think The Guardian decided to just 
dispense with all pretensions of being a kind of uh, liberal left uh, newspaper, even though it cost it it, it, it kind of paid the price with its readers. There were readers who would not necessarily, I think, left wing, but thought, but that kind of realized that it's that the extent of its hostility to Corbyn was so kind of obvious that it it it. It, it kind of seemed strange, the level of hostility that The Guardian had. Um, and I think it really um, showed that um, when, can when candidates came that didn't have the connections uh, to this kind of political and media class that we have in the UK. I mean, just today we're living through a scandal in the UK where a former Guardian journalist, she was actually political editor of The Guardian for at least six years, possibly more, Allegra Stratton, ends up being the spokesperson for a right or far right government that we have in the UK. That transition is counterintuitive, but I think it, the more that you look into the, the social connections and the past of, of Guardian journalists, the degree to which you know, only 1% of uh, people in the UK go to Oxbridge, but something like 40% of these uh, peop uh, of people that go to Oxbridge inhabit the upper echelons of the media, uh, the media class and the fact that they they kind of hang out with each other these people you know Allegra Stratton's uh, husband is a deputy editor I believe of the Spectator uh, these people all hang out with each other whether it's the Guardian the Daily Mail so it, it, again it points to this kind of false idea that we have uh, a kind of uh, a press where which is oppositional in reality to to, to an establishment that it that exists and all and is very chummy with each other Absolutely. And one of the key ways in which that is that kind of relationship is imposed is through the D-Notice Committee. John, could you break down for us what the D-Notice Committee is? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the D-Notice Committee has, has existed for a long time. Um, it didn't it didn't it wasn't initially voluntary. Um, it, I mean, it used to function as it, it was imposed by the government. Um, when he wanted certain uh, national security stories to be uh, to be censored, basically, but in more recent years, the D Notice uh, Committee has basically been a, a voluntary system, where editors of British newspapers uh, voluntarily join join the DSMA uh, committee, and they discuss uh, on a voluntary basis uh, the the items of of potential national national security uh, with with uh, uh, with individuals from from the state. Uh, it's a very British form of censorship. Um, you know, it, it remains it remains a way of the, the British government to, to retain a level of plausible deniability that they're uh, that they're censoring certain news stories. Um, and British uh, journalists who are clearly uh, uh, approximate to the state to deny that they're accepting censorship. Um, so, I mean, there's a, as far as I'm aware, there's been one D notice. Uh, issued with regards to uh, WikiLeaks, and that was back in 2011, uh, with the Iraq war logs, uh, if I recall correctly. And none of, none of the, you know, the, the, the mainstream newspapers to whom the D-Notice was sent uh, actually publicised the fact until it was revealed by uh, none other than Guido Fawkes, the, the right-wing blogger who kind of embarrassed the government for having sent this D-Notice. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I mean, I mean there's, there's a... There's a lot written, there's a lot more written about the D-Notice commit, uh, Committee in a, in a book called The History Thieves by uh, Ian Cobain, which I'd recommend to people to, to know more about how it functions. Um, but I mean, after The Guardian uh, started publishing the Snowden leaks, uh, and I think a lot of people remember when, uh, I believe it was M on 5, went into the, or was it the Met, that went into the Guardian offices? And, and, uh, and they took him to the basement. <laughs> took him to the basement, yeah, made them destroy in a total symbolic uh, yeah, it's totally symbolically because it didn't make any difference. They already had the files anyway, but made them destroy all of their hard drives in the basement of the Guardian. Uh, following that, uh, the Guardian, uh, as Matt, Matt Kennard and Mark Curtis wrote uh, in an article on how you know uh, on how the security services uh, you know gained a foothold in the Guardian uh, like they had never before, uh, described how yeah the Guardian uh, joined the D Notice Committee. Uh, Alan Rusbrigger uh, left, Kath Viner came in, uh, and since then, you know, some of its main national security journalists, Ian Cobain, people like Jonathan Cook as well, uh, have either been forced out, kicked out, or, you know, been obliged to leave. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the structure of the Guardian has certainly changed, um, especially since, since the Snowden leaks, I believe, in 2014. 
um, and it's no longer concerned uh, with real investigative journalism that's going to end up uh, embarrassing for the national security state. I don't know if it's worth just adding, it's, again, it's a kind of contextual thing, yeah. but I think that, you know, we've discussed a kind of perhaps a transition with The Guardian in the last few years, it's kind of rapprochement to the UK security state. But I think, you know, when explaining why, why we have reached a stage where we have these kind of articles, um, you know, we can provide the context that, that The Guardian needs to explain, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the UK security state. But I also think that on, on one level, and I don't want to, and I don't want to let them off the hook here, but just talking from experience as someone that went to live in, say, Venezuela in 2005 and had uh, the Guardian's first correspondent in 20 uh, years, first Latin American correspondent in 20 years, asked to meet with me uh, and, and explain that he neither knew Spanish or knew anything about Latin America. So I think when trying to explain how we reach the stage where we have articles which are which you know have a lot of internal inconsistencies that get past um you know editors etc um i think there's um there's a kind of ignorance um and, a, and an arrogance at play at least when it comes to foreign reporting i'm not saying this is the case with julian assange or whether it's the case uh with um jeremy corbyn but i think that when it comes to the, the there's I think there's a, the, an image of seriousness that The Guardian gives off that, is, that, that the facts betray, basically. And I think that um, only when one comes into close contact with, say, a foreign correspondent who's been sent to cover a region which is in the midst of a, of a kind of uprising of the left and you, and you find out that they don't either speak Spanish or know anything about the region, only then there's a kind of certain reality about uh, what you know, these types of journalists become become aware and it kind of informs how you would evaluate these things going forward. So John, are there any precedents in terms of this wide mobilization to bombard people with disinformation about somebody who has been responsible for showing the inner workings of power? Historically, do we have any precedents to this? Yeah, I think I think I think it's definitely important to look uh, historically at these kinds of cases because I mean the, the Assange case at a certain point seems so so uh, ridiculous in certain cases that it's actually hard to believe <clears throat> the degree to which you know the the national security state has targeted him um, and has targeted him by way of disinformation campaigns. And um, so yeah, I mean I've I've been doing a lot of work about the information research department recently, and that was basically Britain's Cold War propaganda unit that was situated in the Foreign Office. Um, and one of the things that the, that the IRD, the Information Research Department, was doing, uh, particularly during the 1970s, was targeting alternative media sources, uh, one of which was the Morning Star at the time. And what they were basically doing was trying to uh, compile files uh, and compile information uh, and spy on these organisations in order to create uh, articles, sometimes uh, partly true, often partly false, in, in, a, in an attempt to delegitimise them. But an even, an even greater historical parallel that I've found recently is Philippe A.G. Um, now, Philippe A.G. did something quite similar to Assange. Um, uh, he was, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the CIA's most prominent whistleblowers, uh, former CIA official. Uh, he, he, you know, he wrote a really important book called Inside the Company about the CIA, which basically exposed all of their different methods of infiltration, of, of espionage, of counter-espionage, et cetera. So um, in, in the mid-1970s, uh, the U.S. was trying to extradite Philippe A.G. from Britain to the U.S. Um, uh, for, for having published uh, sensitive information, classified information about uh, U.S. operations abroad. Um, and one, I mean, the, the British government at this time, uh, according to the IRD documents that I've seen, the British government was basically trying to figure out a way to reduce public sympathy for A.G. in order to, you know, uh, facilitate his extradition to the U.S., uh, and two ways in which they try to do that is one by painting him as a Russian asset. So you can see that they're trying to limit, uh, especially in liberal left circles, um, symp public sympathy with AG uh, in order to fac facilitate his extradition to the US. And the other way is by um, accusing him of being responsible for the deaths of US agents abroad by revealing their names. Um, so you've got almost a carbon copy of what's happened with Assange 
uh, you know, 55 years later, more or less, uh, sorry, 50 years later, um, you know, accusing him of one, being a Russian agent in order to, you know, uh, in order to dissipate all sympathy among the liberal left circles that you have at The Guardian, that you have at much of, uh, you know, Britain's liberal media, and also to accuse him of being responsible for the deaths of US informants with the publication, uh, following, as Pablo mentioned earlier, uh, the encrypted password to the leak. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, I mean, it's important to, you know, if you look at history, this is not something new. Uh, it seems, you know, the level to which the state services are, are targeting Assange seems absurd, but it's nothing new. Uh, this has happened before. Um, and, you know, I think if we look, if we look to, to, you know, precedents in the past, it becomes easier to believe, uh, you know, that what's happening to Assange is a state coordinated campaign. And through Assange, they target us all. Thank you so much for joining me today, gentlemen, on The Watchdog. I hope to see you both again soon. Thank you.